All right, so the title of this field trip, What Grows Together, Grows Together, Goes Together, um, Exploring Terroir. I'm Kristen, and my co-field trip leader is Chumira. Hello. And just to little, a little bit of a primer for everybody and just to set some ground rules, we have a liaison here from the GSA, um, from RISE, which is Respectful, Inclusive um, Scientific Events. And so that is Audrey, uh, she'll be waving and she'll be monitoring the chat if you have any questions, uh, but more so for showing respect then we wanna be really inclusive and also speak up if you um, have any questions or concerns um, about the topic or the environment, but hopefully we will um, teach you something today and you'll learn a lot about wine and grapes, um, mostly for our speakers who are, we are lucky to have today. And before we begin, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. So the original um, GSA meeting was proposed to be in Montreal, and I want to acknowledge that Montreal is an unceded um, territory um, situated on the territories of the Ganyangahaga. Jojage is a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations. Uh, we want to recognize and respect the Ganangahage as the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which um, we meet today. Hi, <laughs> my name is Kristen Radziniak and my background training is as an isotope geochemist. Um, I've also worked a bit in planetary sciences. I'm currently the outreach administrator at the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences of McGill University in Montreal. But I'm talking to you today from Ottawa, where I'm hanging out with my parents during the um, current pandemic. I also had the pleasure of working as a wine chemist on Klassen Chase um, Vineyard um, for a season. And hello, everybody. My name is Shamira, and I am a glacial a sedimentologist um, by training and also a geologist, obviously. And I just recently graduated from Western University in geophysics and planetary science, actually. And I actually do a lot of field work with the glacial sediments and dig a lot of the pits um, and look at the soil, uh, mostly to kind of know where uh, and what environment and the paleo environment uh, and reconstruct that for a glacial field. Um, so I took some wine science courses as well um, a few years back and I'm very excited. I did a project on the chemistry and biochemistry of what food and wine pairings and also bubble physics, if that is of interest to anybody, but I can talk about that more a little bit later on. But I'll let Kristen explain what we're going to be talking about today for the schedule. Sure, so this is a overview of our field trip activities. Um, you have now met both Shamir and I. We will do a little bit of an icebreaker and then her and I will give a quick overview of geology in Canada, focusing specifically on Southern Ontario, um, because that is where our speakers will be focusing on. We have Keith Tires from Class and Chase Vineyards and Lindsay Bai, who completed her master's at um, Pele Island Estates. And again, some Zoom just guidelines and etiquette. So as you, um, Kristen had mentioned, it, would, it, would, it will be recorded. Um, and if you have any questions, we're all excited about wine and we, you can just unmute yourself at appropriate times and ask the questions. And also the chat is accessible for you to ask questions. Each speaker will have a Q&A regardless at the end of their talks and presentations. So you can also interact with them in that way. And also we'll have a breakout room at the end. But first, to get to know all of you in our audience, I see some people have their cameras on and cameras off, so don't worry about that for now. Um, I just like you guys to actually tell us what your favorite type of wine is. It can be the brand, it can be the actual type of grape that it's from, whatever you know, don't worry, we're not judging you. We don't know much about wine, <laughs> we have the experts come and tell us, but if you can please go to menti.com. Um, and type in the code below that you see, oh, whoops, um, which is 9889266. Um, this will allow us to type words in, um, like what is your favorite wine, and we will create a word cloud together. 
um, of the different types of wine and we can actually see which is the most popular one because the most frequently typed in word will appear in bigger letters. So I'll give you another moment to just type in the code, but it's also available here, which some people have already typed in. Perfect. Pinot Grigio, white, <laughs> just white. <laughs> oh, I don't know what's happening. Are you able to see my screen still? We can I see keep still, it keeps, it keeps bouncing back between the two screens. <laughs> okay, awesome. Wow, red is really popular today. <laughs> So our speakers have that kind of audience today to gauge. Uh, Merlot is the second biggest word. And I think everybody else is pretty even with some bubbles. <laughs> All. I like that person who put that. Yummy. Um, red, blended reds. So feel free. This is kind of a metric for us too, to kind of see. Um, Mendoza, whoa, <laughs> uh, everybody's um, kind of types of wines and what we'll be learning today. I know Keith is our wine expert as well as Lindsay, our terroir expert. So they'll be answering most of those questions, but thank you so much for participating. We've concluded that everybody loves red wine here. Thank you, this is the red wine group. Um, but we'll also be talking about geology as well and how that relates to the wine growing and wine making process. So Chris and I hope to just give you a little bit of a primer, especially just a, a Canadian overview. Um, looking at Southern Ontario, some Quebec, um, some British Columbia, and also the emerging wine regions and what uh, different climate zones, topography, and soil can mean in these different regions. So in Canada, we have a few emerging wine regions and also a few prominent wine regions. And so just the highlighted ones here are British, British Columbia, Ontario, Quebec, and Nova Scotia. Um, and that actually lies on the same latitude as some of the most prominent wine growing cities and countries in the world as well. So this is lying on 30 to 50 degrees latitude. So kind of the mid high latitudes of the earth. Um, and so that's ideally where the perfect wine growing latitude is, some would say, but we also have really great latitudes in the south especially in South America. Um, so as you can see, Canada is in line, sort of, um, with wines from, oh sorry, latitudes from France, Italy, maybe in Northern Spain, um, but this is just to give you a little bit of a sense of where we are in the world um, in winemaking. And so in Canada, prominently, we are very well known, the most popular, I think, stereotypical wine is ice wine for Canadians because you make it, um, as the grapes are frozen. And so um, beyond that though, there's a lot of other um, wineries around Canada, not just in Vancouver, not just in BC and Ontario and Quebec and Nova Scotia. There's also a lot in Alberta, a lot in um, Saskatchewan and Winnipeg, Manitoba and all of that. But the key importance is essentially where and how they are grown. So we have the influence of uh, the Pacific Ocean in the Vancouver um, area, as well as the Rocky Mountains and the little microclimate zones that are formed in these little areas, especially in Toronto, we have the Great Lakes and the Net Niagara Escarpment, as well as Lake Erie and all of that, uh, where all the wineries, um, most of the wineries line up with the Great Lakes. Um, but to just put a sense of numbers, uh, around 280 wineries in British Columbia, 175 in Ontario, and we also have some in Quebec, um, oh, and also in Nova Scotia, um, 22. Um, so emerging wine regions. And so here um, we have a highlight of some of the um, areas we're going to be talking about today. Um, so in the inset you can see the um, Lake Erie Pelly Island and Prince Edward County highlighted. And so this is just to give you a little bit geographically speaking the, the highlight of the area. And one of the exciting parts about this being a virtual field trip is that we don't have to do the, um, the driving distances between, between them to get from one vineyard to the other one. And then also the Monta region area, which is where uh, Montreal is located, also has some wine growing areas. So just since uh, to keep with the, the Montreal theme to start with, um, there are some wine growing regions in Quebec. Um, it's been divided into nine regions and the um, presence of the St. Lawrence River produces um, a lot of microclimates. 
And um, it's also quite well known for ciders, especially in like the Mont St. Hilaire region. So we have these um, igneous plutons that have intruded into the overlying um, carbonate rocks and that kind of creates some, some microclimates there for, for the cider growing. But since our speakers are gonna be coming from Ontario, I'll let Shamira talk to you a bit about the Ontario geology. So for geologists, this map is probably really, really quite intuitive, but for non-geologists, it's a little bit of a puzzle piece. Um, so we're gonna be simplifying this um, litho lithological map of just Ontario. Uh, we have the green, yellows, purples, and pinks as the geological units and the blues as the water. Um, but as you can see where the wine region is in, uh, in Ontario is usually in Southern Ontario where the Phanerozoic or Paleozoic sediments are, which are the youngest sediments. So mostly eroded by glacial, the last glacial maximum. And these are um, mostly like dollstone bedrock that have eroded into fine silts and sands and clays. Um, meanwhile, the other um, types of lithologies are very much uh, igneous and metamorphic, like the Superior, Southern Grenville provinces. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of context on the types of rocks that are in Ontario alone, Ontario as a size, as a province, is actually bigger than the country France itself. So <laughs> meanwhile, on the other side of, uh, in Europe, where all these prominent wine, um, like we have Bordeaux, Champagne, all of these other um, cities well known for their wines, we actually are in similar latitudes as we saw in the previous um, image, but we actually also have the same size just in Ontario alone of one country, as you can see. So the wine making <laughs> um, potential that we can, make, can have is unlimited, I feel. Um, but just to give you a little bit of a sense on the West Coast, uh, we have here the Okanagan Valley and also just Northern Vancouver a little bit, oh sorry, Northern, in the BC wine region. Um, in this paper by Bowen et al, they just talked about the six, they, they divided it into six regions and mapped some of, I think some people would appreciate this map over here, um, just looking at the surficial geology that these areas um, like the Kelowna, um, near Kelowna, the Okanagan Valley, also this Milkameen Valley and all of the other wine growing regions here, you can see the vineyards actually in purple blobs. They are all alongside the valley wall and this creates a certain and particular microclimate for their wines and also specific soils and terroir for their wines. And so that's why different wineries actually have different specialties and varietals of grapes that they prefer and prefer to grow and they just thrive in that specific region. So for example, we have Black Sage in the Osseus Valley, just right here in the Southeast. Merlot is their prominent um, grape, I guess that they really, like the grape really thrives there. And then for example, in the Samilkameen Valley in the Southwest, just a little bit to the other side of the valley, they dominate, they're dominated with Pinot Gris. So this is just a little bit of a metric to show you that even in different areas and regions in Canada, there's different uh, dominations of grapes that are grown for different types of wine. But we'll be focusing on Southern Ontario and this will be a, one of the great focuses of our talk. So now we're going to jump back to uh, Ontario um, to highlight the regions that we're going to be talking about. Um, so here you just have a, a Google Maps version and we've got Montreal highlighted, Ottawa, Lake Ontario and um, circled here in red is Prince Edward County. Not to be confused with Prince Edward Island, which um, is quite famous in Canada as being the home of Lucy Maud Montgomery's character Anna Green Gables. Um, so here we are in Ontario and I'd like to point out that it's peninsula. And that is one of um, the important things with keeping the uh, climate moderated is having the um, surrounding of all the water um, here to help with the extending the, the growing season in these areas. Um, so here we have Claus and Chase Vineyards. And here we have a soil profile of the county. So the um, main uh, rock type here in the area is limestone. And we also have um, clay, um, and as you can see that there's um, different varieties of soil, so you don't have um, the same grapes or the same growing conditions throughout the, the area. And I'd also like to point out that this, uh, the limestone that's prominent here, 
um, continues throughout um, this Trentonian limestone, continues throughout all the way up to um, Montreal and also continues south. Um, we have limestone down in the Niagara Escarpment and further south as well. And I would like to show you some pictures because Clawson Chase is an absolutely beautiful vineyard. So I would invite you one day to hopefully come visit. Um, here you have the, um, the picturesque, uh, the purple barn and um, some of the fields as well. And we have a short video um, from Klaus and Chase to, to give you a feel of actually um, being there. So hopefully our video will work and um, we can show you a little bit about the um, Klaus and Chase vineyard. And uh, some of the grapes that are grown in this area are um, Pinot Noir as well as Chardonnay. And there's also some um, sparkling wines that um, are made in the area, as well as some, some other grapes. So there's uh, Pinot Grigiri as well, and I'll let the uh, um, Keith tell you more about that when he gives his talk. And... Yeah, it's really beautiful here. <laughs> I know watching these videos makes me really want to be able to get out and get out and travel. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I'm there in the vineyard picking the grapes. Yeah, so the, <laughs> the grapes are hand harvested. Kristen, can you tell us a little bit about what you did for the wine chemistry? Oh, sure. So um, I helped uh, set up the wine lab. Um, and my my jobs consisted of I helped I would harvest the um, grapes and we'd look at the seed color and we'd also look at the acidity of the um, the resulting squeeze juice that you get from from squeezing the um, grapes and that would give us a chance to figure out when it was time to harvest we'd look at the the ripening process um, and so measuring things like um, acidity, um, sugar content, um, and as well as seed color. So that those are all indicators of when it's um, time to harvest. Awesome. Okay, now and this is this is a different place now. <laughs> yes, so this is the other um, vineyard that um, Lindsay will be telling us about. So we're further south. Um, so Pelly Island in Ontario is an island um, in Lake Erie, so one of the other Great Lakes, and it is the um, furthest south inhabited island in Canada. And again, you can see being, as an island, being completely surrounded by water is um, important um, for creating these, um, these uh, climates that are conducive to uh, grape growing. Um, so Pele Island is, um, uh, also a very important bird sanctuary area. So um, it is on the migratory pathway of birds. And so that is another um, part of it. And I've listed some of the grapes that grow there. And uh, one of the interesting um, facts about this area too is that Pele Island was once a marsh. And so um, clay marshland soils are not usually conducive to growing good grapes but because they tend to prefer sandy soils um, to help with the the drainage but um, Pele Island does have great growing areas and we also will get you in the uh, the mood by showing a little bit of the video from Pele Island which is also an absolutely stunningly beautiful location here in Canada. Unfortunately we are going to be muting it so we are just going to appreciate the nice island view of the vineyard and I'm pretty sure I don't know Lindsay correct me if I'm wrong that the winery is actually on the coast of Lake Erie and the island itself just houses the vineyard or is there a winery in the vineyard as well? Uh, no that's right the the winery is on the mainland yeah okay yeah yeah these are just some videos of Pelly Island. If you ever are lucky enough to go, ask Lindsay, our speaker, and she'll tell you all the great places and the little tips. <laughs> and these are just a few photos of the Pelly Island uh, vineyards and estates, so a view from the island itself. Um, we don't have, this is a drone image, um, we don't have like an actual aerial photograph, but good enough. Um, and so just talking about wine profiles now because Keith will be talking about that in depth a little bit in the next few slides. So 
I just want to um, put into your attention that although maple syrup itself also has some wine, um, some wine, some flavor profiles such as milky, empyreumatic, floral, fruity, spicy, we also have kind of similar, not well, not similar to maple syrup, but we have also a tasting profile for different palates um, for wine itself. So this is a little bit of a 101 kind of wine tasting guide that I found and I've seen so many times when I've been studying and doing my projects on gastronomy and just trying to find if what grows together goes together. I'm using mapping techniques in GIS. Um, and so you see from the left that you have the classified wine colors. So most clear is mostly sparkling to the deepest red or purple, which is, oh, ice wine or just red wine. And so you also see some food pairings um, that could be possibly, um, <laughs> they suggest to be paired with these wines, like salty foods with sparkling and vegetable dishes with dry whites. But I'm sure Keith will educate us more about all of that. And as well as the science of just wine glasses and how glass is made and blown to be a certain shape because of certain reasons. Um, and most importantly, the aromas and flavors of wines um, can be classified into a lot of categories, but here they classify as fruity, flowery, or herbaceous, and then oak flavors and different types of oak. Um, but these are just a little bit to give you a, of a primer. And as you may or may not have seen from our um, website where you had to click the Zoom, we had some wine recommendations. One is from Keith and one is from Lindsay. Um, and if you'd like, um, Keith, if you'd like to say a few words about this wine, maybe fun facts or <laughs> some. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Prince Edward County is known as a, as a wine region for specifically for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And the one that I have up there is probably its truest expression. Um, I, I make many different Chardonnays, um, all from the same, obviously from the grape varietal Chardonnay. Uh, but how they fermented and how they're aged totally, totally differs. So this one is, uh, we call it the Loyalist Chardonnay, uh, given that this area is, was United Empire Loyalist uh, uh, back when it first started, uh, first settled, uh, other than the, uh, the indigenous people that were here before we came. Um, and what, what they found, what we found is that the Loyalist is a true expression of the terroir. It's a true expression of, of the place. So that rock and that, that limestone that, that our vines take their feet into uh, because this has, um, for lack of a better word, is unadulterated with the combination of oak or lees contribution. It's uh, stainless steel fermented, um, aged, um, 60 days on its lees, no stirring, so there's no, none of that yeast octolysis that is, is introduced to the wine. And so you get a true kind of crisp, mineral, fruit-driven uh, wine, um, very, similar to wines that may appear from places like Chablis. That's awesome, it. thank you. You're welcome. I, if anybody has this wine today, if, <laughs> if you managed to buy it before you came here, or I know in Canada it might be easier to get. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but I know we have some international attendees, so. You might not have this specific wine, um, but Riesling from Pelly Estates. I don't know, Lindsay, if you want to say a few things. I just love this wine. But you could... um, yeah, this is one of the ones that I tasted when I did my sampling at uh, Pelly Island. Um, and yeah, it's just really good. It's, it's, a, it's a very nice summer wine. It's nice and light and kind of crisp. Um, but yeah, it's just yeah. one that I really like from, from the winery. Yeah, I love how both of the recommendations are white wines. So maybe we can also talk about reds because our audience seems to love red wine here today. <laughs> but first, um, we'd actually like to test your knowledge a bit. Don't worry, it's not that intimidating. It's just very fun trivia for just Canadian wine in general and also some um, fun facts about international wine and just grapes. So if you please go to kahoot.it and enter the code 9032629. We have a few questions uh, for you ready to go. Um, and we just love to really, don't worry, it's not really competitive. You won't see your ranks at the end. I won't even see if you won or not. Maybe just the top three people, but 
if you do really badly, that's completely fine. This is supposed to be just fun. Um, and I see everybody's here almost. I will wait a few more seconds just so that um, we have 36 participants. So we'll, I'll wait until we hit 30 at least. And if you just like to tune in, you can just watch. You don't have to participate if you don't want to. Um, oh, yes. Almost there. <laughs> and if our speakers, if you feel like you want to chime in on an answer and uh, shed more knowledge <laughs> upon the question, feel free to, for sure. Um, okay, we are now at 24. I think I'll wait for one or two more and then we can begin. We have 20 seconds essentially to answer each question, so it should be fun and quite easy, so. Awesome. Okay, anybody else? Last call, last call? Alrighty, let's play some background music as well. So, how many glasses of wine do Canadians enjoy annually? And you actually, no matter how fast you answer, it's okay. As long as you learn something um, or get it wrong, it's fine. We encourage wrong answers. <laughs> I didn't even know any of these questions when I made them. Now I do. It's actually over 500 million. That's what Keith said also yesterday when he looked at this. But we drink a lot of wine. <laughs> so we've learned from that question. VQA. This is an acronym that we see in every Canadian liquor store and a lot of wines. Um, but it stands for something. One second to go. You gotta think really fast for 20 seconds. Yes, it stands for Vintners Quality Alliance. Um, not assurance, I always make the, mix those up. Okay, how many liters of wine annually does Canada consume? So you know we consume a lot, but how much? Per capita. Sorry, I missed that part. Yes, wow, uniform, almost, 15 liters. And the Canadian province with the largest per capita consumption is, we even show you a map here to pick from. So is it the purple, is it the green, is it the yellow, is it the red? Learn about Canadian geography too. Quebec, yes. Quebecois people just drink a lot of wine too. Maybe most of our Canadian wine drinkers are in Quebec. The first Canadian commercial winery, winery license granted was to which winery? Sorry, that was a tongue twister. The picture's a hint. <laughs> I think you saw this picture in the presentation, actually. <laughs> Yay, awesome. Keith, are you the winemaker? <laughs> I feel like you know all the answers. <laughs> That's not fair. Um, okay, the Niagara wine region lies on which, um, the same latitude as which of these options? These are specific cities now, not just countries. I think we did show a little bit of this in the beginning, but yes, it's Bordeaux. Unfortunately, not Champagne, France. Close, 
I think Keith mentioned yesterday that it was north a little bit more. So what is the average number of grapes used to make a bottle of wine? It's subjective, but the closest guess is this estimated number. And now every time you look at a bottle of wine, you'll just say, wow, <laughs> there were this many grapes in my bottle. Hand pressed. <laughs> oh no, hand picked, not hand pressed. 736, cool. 736 grapes in that one bottle, perhaps. How, ab about how many bubbles are there in champagne in a bottle? You guys are getting good at this, I think. I feel like there's some bias with the colors, um, but yes. Correct. Okay, which famous Canadian comedian owns a Canadian winery? I'm Canadian and I don't even know a lot of Canadian comedians, but <laughs> best guess is also okay. Cool, you guys all got it correctly. Most people. Um, the father of Canadian wine, who is he? Yes. Wow. I feel like there's a lot of wine drinkers that's just good. So are you guys wine enthusiasts or just, you just really love wine, which is why you're probably here. Many Canadian winemakers make extensive use of Harvesting. There are how many wineries in Canada? Awesome, you guys are answering so quickly. Oh, this is an even spread. There is a, more than a thousand. But I think merging wineries, I think those also should count. So I feel like there's more than that now. Um, the first commercial winery in Canada opened in, which was Pelly Island Vineyard. So I don't think we mentioned that in our little introduction, but just best guess. Oh, 1866, way, way back. Okay, halfway. The largest producer of ice wine in the world is. Ooh, just racking up all the answers. I feel like this is gonna be very, yes, uniform. So Canada, very good. Okay, approximately what percentage of the current price of wine in Canada is government taxes? You'll be very surprised with this answer if you don't know yet. Sixty-seven percent. We pay sixty-seven percent of our taxes for wine. Just oh, sorry, the wine is taxed that much. Which of the following is not a hybrid grape? I'm 
sure maybe Keith will also talk about some great varietals later. But yes, correct. Everybody almost got that correctly. These are admittedly hard questions for me, but <laughs> grapes for ice wines are picked at which temperature? <laughs> so. No, <laughs> just below negative eight, actually. It has to be more than zero, well, yes, less than zero degrees. What is noble rot? And we have a picture of the grapes here too that experience noble rot. It's the same color as the grapes. <laughs> Correct. It is a fungal attack on the grapes, which is a big problem for a lot of vineyards. Which hockey player owns a Canadian winery? It, I can tell you it's in Niagara on the Lake. but I won't tell you which um, team he played for. Oh, okay, awesome. Wayne Gretzky, yes. Which of these is not a Canadian winery? <laughs> so all of these are Canadian wineries except for one. Believe it or not. <laughs> Oh no, it sounds so real. Me and Kristen also got um, confused by this one. Bun and Punishment is a great name for a vineyard or a winery, sorry. Um, but that one is false. Uh, what factor contributes most to the loss of grapes for ice wine? Government bureaucrats. <laughs> Love it. Yes, temperature's too warm to harvest. Ontario produces what percentage of Canadian wines? So these are just the, a dark purple are the VQA official um, regions and I think emerging wine regions are in lavender. So we got Keith's winer, um, vineyard and winery over here and then we have Lindsay over here in Pelly Island. 90%. Ooh. Whoa. <laughs> but which winery was the first Aboriginal owned in North America? And this is actually in British Columbia. Yes, perfect, everybody, almost. Okay, almost there, a few last questions. So what type of wine is the most popular among Canadians? I think this will prove our point today with our audience, but um, in our word cloud, um, we all said, most people said that they really like red wine and alas, the most popular wine among Canadians is red wine indeed. Okay, last four questions or three questions. Each year, approximately how many 375 milliliters bottles of ice wine are made in Canada? Two million bottles. When in doubt, always pick the largest one. So that's for export as well as just general distribution in the country. 
Um, which of the following is the most planted white wine grape varietal by Hector in Canada? And we got two last questions after this and we will move on. And hopefully you will have learned something. So, oh, Pinot Green. Okay, second to last, which of the following is the most planted red wine varietal? Merlot. And last but not the least, which of the following wine regions has the largest planted area of vines in Canada? So we talked about this a little bit, just to give you a sense of geography, but we actually didn't say which is the biggest one. Or did we? <laughs> Yes, so it's the Niagara Peninsula in Ontario. So Niagara on the Lake and all around that area. But great job, everybody. Thank you for participating in our little trivia and I hope you learned something. Congratulations, Erin. And congratulations, Shoshe. And I don't know if people actually put their real names, but, and SK, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, now we'll move back to our presentation where Kristen, I'll pass it on to you. Great. I have the pleasure now of introducing Keith Tires to you formally. Keith grew up in Kingston, Ontario, where he developed a keen interest in wine and food. He moved to Toronto, um, fueled by his passion for wine, and he took uh, the International Sommeliers Guild program at Humber College. After a few years of part of the big city restaurant scene, Keith decided to move closer to home and enjoy a quieter lifestyle. He moved to Prince Edward County um, and settled on Clawson Road with his wife, Cassandra, and their young family. And uh, Keith's wife also runs a um, bike touring company. So if you visit um, Prince Edward County, you can enjoy uh, wines and biking in the area. Keith began his winemaking career as a vineyard hand in 2003, soon after his arrival in the county. This quickly led to um, him being an assistant winemaker under Deborah Pacus for several years, and after a brief period in wine consulting and sales, Keith returned to Claus and Chase and took over as winemaker in 2015. Since then, he has continued the tradition of excellence in Chardonnay and has also followed his passion of producing exceptional Pinot Noir. Keith's philosophy is to capture what Mother Nature grows in a bottle, creating the best possible expression of local terroir. Thanks so much for being with us today, Keith. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's always nice to come and talk about food and wine. We there? Can you hear me yep. okay? Yeah. Okay, Great. perfect. Um, yeah, so when you think about food and wine pairings, um, obviously the easiest place to always start is white and red. Um, but we're also seeing that there's a lot of crossover now as rosés become very popular and sparkling wines are on the rise. So it's always easiest if you know the varietal that you want to consume um, with certain types of food. So the old saying is um, white before red and dry before sweet. Um, which are fairly easy philosophies and that's just generally how you'd set up a meal. So if you're having a multi-course meal then you know maybe you start with a if you're going to do all whites then you start with the lightest white first um, which would be a dry white moving into maybe a barrel fermented or a barrel aged white after that and finishing off with some sweet wine uh, and the same holds true for red wines as well you move from the lighter varietals uh, up into the, the bigger varietals um, and one of the easiest ways to differentiate um, weight of wine, although it's not always accurate, but um, easy way to think about it is the, the bolder, the darker, the richer the wine, the higher the alcohol percentage, um, the more significance um, you're going to have to place on whatever the main part of your dish is. So if you're, you know, we always say chicken and white or fish and white and then um, red meat with red wine. 
Uh, and that generally holds true. But if you're cooking with red wine that's in something like a Coco Vin or something like that, um, where you're stewing something in red wine, then obviously a red wine that you've cooked with pairs best with um, the red wine that you cook with is going to be the wine that you should consume with the food. Uh, it all depends on, on where you're going. Um, cream sauces generally tend to lend themselves to wines that are barrel fermented, barrel aged, that have gone through what we call malolactic fermentation, which is the conversion of malic acid, uh, which are those green uh, apple acids, into the creamy milk acids. Uh, and they generally tend to work well with cream sauces or butters um, because there's a, that nice affinity. So we talk about pairing with affinities and pairing with contrast. Uh, so something like uh, uh, a Thai dish, which has some heat to it, then you pair something uh, that has some sweetness to it, whether it's an off-dry Riesling or uh, an off-dry Wurzstraminer, um, where the sweetness and the heat counterbalance each other and open themselves up. The same thing holds true for saltiness. Generally speaking, saltiness and sweetness go together, uh, but as well as bubbles, which are cleansing, which are acid, uh, actually work as well in, in that terminology too. They also work, bubbles also work well with, uh, with fatty things. It's the one exception to food pairings. Um, is when you introduce bubbles. Um, but ultimately, the one thing when it comes to pairing food and wine is to look at where the wine comes from and what they eat in that area. So if you're, uh, for example, if you're, if you're drinking Chablis, um, which is uh, the ancient soils in there are the uh, Cambridgean chalk and the ancient, uh, ancient limestone of that area, um, which is full of fossilized shells, and creatures, which I actually happen to have a piece of here. Um, I'll have some chalk as well. Um, so what you end up with is, uh, you can't really see it too well, but because uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a rock fiend, I'm not certified as you guys are, but uh, rock is important to me as a winemaker, so it becomes important to me as somebody who loves food and wine. And this, this rock is full of uh, fossilized crustaceans and mollusks uh, from the ancient seabed. Um, this one is actually from, uh, I think this came from uh, Chablis when I was there last year. And what you end up with is that, that translation of minerality and acidity it goes, into the, goes into the grape and therefore becomes part of the wine and ultimately tells you the story of where the, the fruit comes from, but also will therefore have an affinity with those things. That's why one of the, the, the main things is Chablis with oysters uh, because of all those small crustaceans and, in the in the in the limestone that comes out of Chablis, they have a really good uh, affinity with those things. Um, as you move into wines that have a bit more richness and roundness to them, for example, from Chablis, then you start working into roasted chickens and things that are a little more heavier and a little have a little more density and richness to them. Um, and then you move all the way up to to fully barrel fermented barrel aged wines, um, where you can actually uh, do things like a, a filet mignon with them, where they have enough weight, enough richness, enough texture to both handle the, the protein of the meat uh, and cut through some of the, the fattiness, although uh, flay's pretty lean, so you want some of that refreshing acidity there. Uh, so there are classic wine pairings uh, and food pairings, um, as I've mentioned. Um, generally speaking, lighter whites with lighter dishes, so in terms of things like Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, um, and uh, Riesling and un oak Chardonnays, um, they generally tend to work what I call with the white meat, the roasted white meats uh, into the fish category. Um, and then as you move into um, barrel fermented barrel aged Chardonnays, some uh, Simeon uh, blends or Roussillon Marseille blends from the Cote de Rhone, you start looking into richer, heavier uh, dishes, uh, like as we're coming into the, the winter season. Um, that can take some more cream nuance to them or some heavier fruit compositions. Uh, and you start to look at things like pork um, that they also generally tend to work very well with, especially when you're cooking with things like apples or uh, um, white figs or white plums and, and so on and so forth. So try and match the, the heaviest part of the dish uh, with the wine um, and whether it's a, a, a contrast or a, a synergy together, it all depends on what you're looking to, to try and do. Um, I, hope, I, hope, I hope I'm answering, I'm going on a bit of a roundabout here because when it comes to food and wine pairing, there's, there's guidelines, there's no definitive answer because each wine is gonna be different from each place in the world. 
uh, and how it works together uh, will be totally different. But generally speaking, red wines that are higher in acid will work better with um, food dishes that are higher in acid, like tomato sauces and Sangiovese work really well together. And all those things go part and parcel. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, adventure to try pairing different foods and different wines with the same dish. And sometimes the best thing you can do is to work those things together and have the people sitting around the table have two different wines in front of them uh, with the same dish and let them choose what they think is the best food and wine pairing to go with that. Are there any questions? What about ice wine? Uh, ice wine has a great uh, affinity with um, salty cheeses, so blue cheeses work really well. Uh, classic pairing for ice wine is creme brulee as well. Um, and anything that has some apricot in it, generally speaking. Biscotti is another nice one to work with it as well. So if you're uh, in this time where we're all baking, uh, if you're making your own uh, baked goods, cookies and stuff like that, um, you can consider pairing an ice wine with them. Uh, ice wine is unctuous and sweet, but the key factor in ice wine is, is its acidity. Uh, and in Ontario and in Canada, the one thing we have in spades, even as far west and in the hotter parts of uh, like Soyuz and in the southern Okanagan Valley, is even out there where it's, ex it's a desert, uh, and the wines get exceptionally ripe with high sugar content and therefore fairly robust alcohols, um, we still have acidity. And that's part of being in a cool climate. So there's, there's generally speaking, the great thing about Canada is uh, in the height of the growing season is those warm days and those cool nights, which, help, which helps retain acidity. And acidity is a major contributing factor to the affinity of a, a wine to pair with food. Uh, so think about that as you move forward. Um, and when you cook with stuff, think about what it is that you're cooking with uh, in terms of complementing the wine. So if you're, for example, having, uh, just go with something. So you're gonna roast a chicken. If you're gonna roast a chicken and you're gonna have um, uh, Chardonnay, for example, and it's a barrel fermented barrel aged Chardonnay, maybe consider rubbing the outside of the chicken with some, uh, with some greeny Dijon mustard um, and a bit of, uh, bigger herbs as opposed to basil, maybe move towards thyme and maybe throw some Mirapois in the center of the chicken so you get some earthiness in there. And you'll find that not only will you retain some moisture, but you'll also end up with more complexity of flavor, um, which actually helps enhance the wine um, to do more with the chicken. Um, shellfish and seafood, uh, generally speaking, you don't have to go too overboard with things, a little bit of butter. Uh, maybe some, some citrus in there, whether it's a, um, just a simple pan sauce of taking the jus and, and mixing in some, some uh, veggie stock or some fish stock if you make your own, uh, and using that as a sauce with some citrus in it always work well. Um, as far as reds go, uh, the key thing with reds, and this is, this is a contributing factor nowadays, is as we warm up, not sure if global warming is something that you'll talk about or climate change or whatever whatever tag you want to call it um, alcohols are definitely increasing in wines uh, and the counterbalancing factor to alcohol is fat so if you have um, if you're a california cab fan and you like your 14 15 percent alcohols um, richer wines that are or richer foods that are have a little more fat content in them generally tend to work better with those those richer heavier alcohol wines um, whereas lighter alcohol wines for example like pinot noir grown here in ontario that comes in at 12 to 13 percent alcohol um, and has a good amount of acidity also pair themselves uh, well to other roasted dishes um, as you change your cooking method if you're grilling which is a very intense hot heat uh, i would say if, you, if you're cooking it fast, you're gonna have charring and that charring requires more robustness in the wine. If you're doing things very slow, like a braise, then you want slightly more complex wines with a little more um, lower alcohol because you don't have all that richness in there in the meat because you've, you've cooked it out. If you're, a, if you're a vegan or vegetarian, um, the same thing holds true. Uh, whatever you're putting with, your legumes or your vegetables, uh, if you're grilling them, 
then all of a sudden with that char and that toastiness, you move into things that can take some barrel contribution to them. So if you're a red wine drinker, you know, maybe, maybe a, a Merlot uh, is the way to go. Uh, if you're a burger person and you like drinking wine with your burgers, things that uh, like a hybrid, like a Baco, that has good acidity to it, but has some good weight, can take some of those classic kind of vinegary um, condiments that we use. Uh, vinegar is something that's very difficult to pair with. You need a really high acidic wine to, to counterbalance the acid in vinegar. Uh, all wine will go to vinegar if, if we let it uh, as winemakers, uh, but our choice is to not do that. We intervene and we stop it. Um, and so that type of acidity or that acetic acid um, requires, um, uh, requires that type of, uh, of acid contribution to help pair it up. Any other questions? <laughs> Awesome. Well, what we might do um, right now <laughs> is take a quick 10 minute break because I don't know if anybody else is hungry and thirsty after that, um, but we'll take a quick break and we'll allow everybody to um, replenish whatever sort of um, beverage they want to consume if they want to grab some snacks and then we'll come back and hear more from um, Keith and Lindsay um, from Pele States and some more about Kloss and Wines. Yeah, we'll cut the break short. Um, 10 minutes, so stretch it out, get some more wine if you have some, and refill your drinks. And I know Kristen just asked in the chat, um, is anybody else enjoying a glass of wine? Um, and so if you'd like to type in the chat what glass of wine, type of wine that you're enjoying in the meantime, and sit back, enjoy the next speaker, which is Lindsay. I'd like to welcome Lindsay. Um, she's a close friend of mine and also recently completed her master's degree in geology at Western and her research focuses on the soil geochemistry of Pelly Island. She specifically evaluated how the underlying geology influenced the compositions of overlying soils and how nutrient availability in the soils varied with depth. So there's the results of her study, will, she'll show you in a sec, so many pretty pictures, um, helped to guide soil management of the Pelly Island vineyards allowing the winery to optimize soil fertility and ultimately improve grape quality in wine terroir. So I'll give the floor to you, Lindsay. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, oh. thank you. Yes. Um, and how do I share? I have to share my screen now, right? Yes, uh, just the green button in the, um, the bottom. Oh, there, yes. Okay. Okay, can, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. And you're pinned also, so you're the first like oh. block, block that everybody sees, so you're okay, good. Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, so today I'm just gonna be giving you guys um, just kind of a condensed uh, version of my thesis presentation. So we're gonna be talking about a little bit about Pelee Island and Terroir, and then a lot about the soils um, on Pelee Island. So my thesis topic, um, was determining geological controls on nutrient availability at different depths in the soils of the Pelee Island winery. Um, so I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about where it's located. So it's located 25 kilometers off the North shore of Lake Erie. Um, and that's just depicted in the image on the left. Um, and conditions here are ideal to grow grapes because the island has the longest growing and frost free season in Canada and it also has very fertile and clay rich soils. Um, and so now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the history of the winery. Um, so the grapes were first grown in the 1860s on the island and the Vin Villa was one of the earliest wineries built on the island and the Vin Villa is showed in the black and white image on the left. Um, in the 1900s, um, oh, sorry, this is in the way. Um, in the 1900s, um, grape growing was well established, and the island became a significant producer of wine. Um, until in 1935, the wine house was destroyed by fire. And it wasn't until the 1980s that grapes were reintroduced to the island, and wine production restarted. Um, so today, the island is now the largest private estate winery in Canada, and it has won hundreds of awards around the world, particularly for their Cabernet Franc ice wine. 
Um, and there are 17 grape varieties grown on the island, and that includes Chardonnay, Pinot Grigio, Riesling, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Pinot Noir. So the climate there, um, they have warm, humid summers and cold winters. Um, precipitation is evenly distributed throughout the year, and the growing season there begins late May and ends in mid-October. Um, the island also experiences low precipitation and a high number of sunny, sunny days throughout the growing season. Um, so climate and precipitation are very important factors um, that control grape ripening and quality, and this will ultimately affect the taste of wine and the terroir. Um, so there are many vineyard aspects, um, some of which include uh, soil, geology, climate, um, and geography, and these can affect um, grape ripening quality and the terroir. And terroir is defined as the relationship between the sensory attributes of wine and its origin, so where it, where it was grown. Um, it can also be affected by human controlled variables, and these are things like vineyard management, um, grape variety selection, and vinification, which is the winemaking process. Um, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the influence that geology has on grape quality. Um, and so the geology can actually affect the terroir of wine. Um, and so an example of this is in Burgundy, France. So they have three distinct wine regions there, and these are actually um, divided by subsurface faults. Um, and this controls um, bedrock bedrock weathering. Um, so in areas where the weathering is very intense, um, it creates finer particles. So the soil is um, a higher clay content. Um, and so it retains water better than areas where um, the bedrock is less weathered. So it has a more gravelly soil and it will allow um, water to drain more easily. Um, and so soils producing fine wines are not restric restricted to one soil type. Um, and so an example of this is if you look at the images on the left hand side. So in Bordeaux, France, a lot of the um, vines here are grown in a gravelly soil. Um, in Burgundy, France, they're grown on a more clay lime rich soil. And in St. Emily on Bordeaux, they're grown on a heavy clay. Um, however, context is important. So you have to think about the availability of water to the grape plant. Um, so in areas where there's high precipitation, vines will actually grow better um, where the soil is more coarse so that water can, um, can uh, run through uh, the soil a lot better so the uh, grape roots aren't saturated throughout the growing season. Whereas in areas where there's low precipitation, it might be better um, for the vines to be growing on a more dense soil, so a higher clay content. And so this will provide water to the plant roots um, throughout the growing season. So there's many interconnected variables that contribute to a region's terroir, but I'm going to be specifically focusing on how geology and soil composition affect terroir. Um, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about Appalachians and VQA. So Appalachians are acclaimed wine regions, um, and these are regulated by the Vintners Quality Alliance. Um, and this ensures authenticity and quality of Canadian wines. And for these Appalachians to gain a status, the regions must have a unique sense of place. And they demonstrate this uniqueness through things like um, geology, soil, climate, and or geography. And Ontario has three recognized Appalachians, and that's the Lake Erie North Shore Appalachian, the Prince Edward County, and the Niagara Peninsula. And Peely Island is part of the Lake Erie North Shore Appalachian. And it used to actually be its own Appalachian. However, in 2013, it lost its Appalachian status. And this was because at the time, they were sourcing grapes from the mainland, but also um, sourcing grapes uh, from uh, the island as well. So the objectives of my thesis were first to determine the relationship between Pelee Island subsurface geology and Pelee Island soils. And the second one was to assess nutrient variation among soil sampling depths and soil sampling locations. So I'm just going to give a little bit of the background on the Pelee Island geology. Um, so southern Ontario has a history of uh, heavy glaciation. 
Um, and so these glacial events controlled the bedrock topography and created the island's bowl-shaped topography. So the island is actually quite shallow at the edges and then it's very deep towards the center of the island. Um, so as the glaciers advanced, they eroded the underlying limestone bedrock and these glaciers deposited tills that range in thickness from about zero meters, so that's towards the edges of the island to 29 meters um, in the center. Um, and the soils are derived from the tills, so this means that they also have a high carbonate content um, because the tills were formed from the erosion of the underlying limestone bedrock. So here's a subsurface cross section of Pelee Island. So this is just showing the different layering on the island. Um, and this is generated from, a, from seismic survey data. So they use ge geophysical methods to create this image. Um, so you can see the soil layer is quite thin. It's maybe a couple meters. And then the remainder of that is till and federal. Um, so rare earth elements can be used to fingerprint wine. And by this, this means that rare earth element signatures can be found, can be used to verify authenticity of wines and identify the place of origin. So identify where they were grown. Um, and in geology, we also use this, um, we also use rare earth elements to trace the origin of parent material. And this is because rare earth elements have low solubility and mobility. Um, however, rare earth elements did not provide any nutritional value to Um, so there are 17 essential elements and these are divided into macro and micronutrients that plants need um, to grow really well. And these nutrients are important for plant growth and reproduction and they're just listed on the right hand side there. Um, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the soil profile because I'll be getting into talking about soil a little bit more in, later in the presentation. Um, so there's four soil horizons. The first one is the O horizon, and it's about five centimeters, and it's composed of partially decomposed organic matter. Um, the next one is the A horizon, and it's about 10 to 25 centimeters thick, and it contains decayed organic matter and organic acids that were leached down from the O horizon. Um, it has a lower pH, so it's slightly more acidic. Um, it's known as a zone of depletion, and I'll talk a little bit more about why it's called a zone of depletion later. Um, the next one is the B horizon, and this varies in thickness, um, and it commonly contains iron and manganese oxides, um, and it has a higher pH than the A horizon, so it's less acidic, and it's known as a zone of accumulation. Um, the final one is the C horizon, and this lies directly over top of bedrock and commonly contains bedrock fragments. So here's a picture of where I took my soil samples. Um, on the island and my samples were chosen based on soil location, soil depth and fertilization strategy. So I tried to take some from the middle of the island where, there, where the soils were deeper and then I also took some from the edges of the island where the soil was a little bit shallower. Um, and so this is just showing kind of how I uh, sampled the soil. So we use what's called a gas powered auger and this is just to help assist a metal sampling rod into the ground. And then once it's removed, you get kind of a, a tube of soil. And so we had 19 soil cores and we took four samples from each core. Um, so a sample depth one was taken from the A horizon and then two, three, and four um, were taken from the B horizon, so in the deeper soil. Um, and then these are just some of the uh, things that we looked at. So we analyzed the tills, the soils, and the fertilizers that they use on the island. So the first thing we looked at um, was the influence that the tills had on soil composition. So this graph is just comparing rare earth elements in soils and also in the glacial tills. So on the y-axis is the rare earth element concentration values, and on the x-axis is the rare earth elements. And so as I previously said, the reason we're using rare earth elements is because they're used to trace the origin of parent material. Um, so if you look at the, the red line, um, that's the rare earth element concentrations of the soil, and the blue line is the rare earth element concentrations in the till. 
And um, although the absolute concentrations between these are not the exact same, the distribution patterns um, are very similar. So from this, we can conclude that the Pelee Island tills do influence the composition of the Pelee Island soils. Um, next, we looked at um, soil trace element distribution patterns. And um, the reason we did this was just to see um, if the elements in the soil were different among different sampling locations, so at different areas on the island, or if they are different at different depths in the soil. So the graph on the right, um, each colored line indicates um, a different soil sampling location. And on your y-axis, you have the concentration of trace elements. And on the x-axis are your different trace elements. So what this shows it does, is that there's no consistent element concentration difference between sampling locations on the island. However, if you looked at the graph on the right, this is now comparing different soil depths on the island. And again, you have your trace element concentrations on the y-axis and then your uh, different trace elements on the x-axis. And this is showing that um, soils taken from depth one in the blue um, have higher concentrations of trace elements compared to soils taken um, at depth four, which is in the deeper soils. Um, so this is showing um, a relative enrichment of trace elements in surface soils compared to deep soils. Lindsay, there was just a question about what the rees are normalized to. Oh, uh, they're normalized to the North American shale composite. Yeah. Um, so then after um, uh, finding out this, we wanted to look at the soil processes that affect the distribution of elements at different depths within the soil profile. And for this, we use what's called the principal component analysis. And that's just a statistical analysis method um, that detects variation in large data sets. Um, and so before we did that, we just wanted to look at some of the factors that can also affect the distribution of elements in the soil profile. So those are things like pH, organic matter content, and carbonate content. So the graph on the left is comparing organic matter content um, at different depths in the soil profiles. So you have organic matter content on your y-axis and pH on the x-axis. And this is showing that shallow soils have high organic matter content and uh, a lower pH, so they're more acidic, whereas deeper soils, so those are indicated in yellow, have um, a lower organic matter content and higher pH, so they're um, less acidic. And the graph on the right is comparing carbonate content at different soil depths. So shallow soils have um, a very low carbonate content, whereas the deeper soils have higher carbonate content. And so this diagram kind of just explains the reasons for that. So we're looking at the effect of pH and organic matter on mineral weathering. Um, so there's organic acids in the surface soils and um, these break down minerals specifically calcite, which releases calcium. Um, and this creates a relative enrichment of aluminum in the A horizon, because aluminum is incorporated into more resistant minerals. Um, so then as, um, as calcite is broken down in the surface soil, it's then leached into the deeper soils, and it's able to precipitate um, in the absence of organic acids. So this means that highly weathered surface soils will contain more aluminum and deep soils will contain less aluminum and more calcium. So now this is just showing um, a, a depth profile of the Pelee Island soils. And this is specifically sh um, showing the A horizon that's highlighted in yellow. So on the y-axis, you have soil depth. So from the very surface, so at zero centimeters down to 250 centimeters depth. Um, and the colors indicate the sampling depth. So orange was depth one, blue depth two, green three, and purple was depth four. And so the first two graphs are showing um, that there's more aluminum and silicon in the surface soils in Pelee Island. And if you look at the graph on the right, it's showing that there's less calcium in the surface soils. Um, next, we looked at the B horizon. So again, these graphs are showing 
um, depth on the y-axis and then on the x-axis you have different elements. Um, and this is showing that in the B horizon elements like manganese, magnesium, iron, molybdenum, cobalt, and nickel are uh, more abundant and they're tending to accumulate in this zone. Um, we also analyzed plant extractable nutrients and these are the nutrients that are loosely bound to soil particle surfaces. Um, and organic matter releases acids and this breaks down minerals and then this process will release the nutrients that um, are available for plant roots to take up. Um, and organic matter has a large surface area, so this allows for nutrient exchange and attachment, and this will help prevent um, leaching of nutrients from surface soils. And what we found was that plant extractable nutrients were most abundant in surface soils, where organic, where organic matter is also abundant. Um, so if you look at the two graphs on the right, um, you can see that mang magnesium and manganese are um, have the highest concentrations in the surface. The only essential element that wasn't um, available, most available in surface soils was molybdenum, and this was actually more available in deep soils. Um, and this is just because it's usually found as an oxyanion, so it attaches to hydroxides which are formed in deep soils. Um, so from this, uh, from the plant extractable nutrient data, uh, this shows that organic matter content, clay abundance, and absorption are the most important factors that control the nutrient availability. Um, and when we saw that there was um, an enrichment of trace elements in surface soils, we wondered if maybe that could have been from the fertilizers they were using on the island. What we did was we plotted the rare earth element concentrations of soils in the island grown compost and the chemical fertilizers that they were using. We plotted those on the same graph. Um, and what we found was that the distribution patterns of chemical fertilizers don't match the distribution patterns of soils. Um, and so therefore it's the enrichment is not caused by the addition of chemical fertilizers. However, when we compared um, the distribution patterns of soils to the compost, so that's the, the soils is the brown line and then the compost is in blue, uh, yellow and green. Um, these distribution patterns do match. So from this we could conclude that the cause of rare earth element enrichment in surface soils is actually from the addition of organic matter. Um, and this is something kind of interesting that the principal component analysis picked up. Um, the two graphs on the left are comparing copper concentrations in fields where grapes are present to where grapes are absent. So we also, um, in our study, look, we took soil from um, wheat fields and alfalfa fields, so fields that didn't have grapes. And what we noticed was that where grapes are present, there was a higher um, copper concentration in surface soils compared to where grapes are absent. Um, and this is because they use a copper spray on the plant leaves, and this is just to control for plant disease. And then if you look at the three graphs on the right, um, this is comparing concentrations, concentrations of cadmium, lead, and uranium. And this is just showing that these are also more concentrated in surface soils. And this is actually a result from airborne pollutants, so things like um, automotive gasoline. Um, so what we found from the study was that glacial tills influence the composition of soils um, and nutrients are released by weathering of the A horizon and are most available in surface soils. Um, nutrient availability is controlled by organic matter, clay abundance and adsorption. Um, and this study has outlined the main controls on soil geochemistry and calcareous vineyard soils and provided the winery with valuable information to improve their soil management practices. Awesome. We have a question in the chat um, asking how deep do the grapevine roots normally go horizon wise? Um, so typically they're only in the first maybe 30 centimeters or so. That's where most of the roots are, but they can actually get down to a couple meters. So most of them are in the A horizon. And then you do get some deep roots in the B horizon as well. 
Does anybody else have any questions for Lindsay? We also have another Q&A session at the end. So if you want, you can save your questions then, but we can talk a little bit if you just have any questions about her field work experience too, drinking wine <laughs> while doing field work. <laughs> How long was um how long did you go for to collect your data? Um not long, maybe a few days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty quick. If there are no questions, other questions, then Oh no, there's another question. Yes, in the chat. How did you get involved with the project? Um it was just through some of my professors at school. Um I was looking to do a master's project and they 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 found this one out. I think they had been talking to the the vineyard manager at the winery and he was interested in getting seeing what was in his soils. It's a pretty unique place to study. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um cool and so I guess I wanted to also ask, what happens to the data that you collected? Do you give it to them as just like a report um, to the winery or the vineyard? Yeah, so we gave them all our geochemical data, so everything that we got from the soils, and then, yeah, we wrote up a little report for them as well. Yeah. Another question. Um, what types of wine is the island known for? Um, they're most known for their Cabernet Franc ice wine, but they have all different types. Like they grow, um, what did I say, like uh, um, uh, Pinot Noir and uh, Riesling and things like that too. And another question as well uh, from Maria. What um, actions did the winery take to improve their wine based on your study? I'm not sure yet because I just finished and so I just submitted my report but I'm assuming that they're going to kind of adjust their I would assume their fertilization strategies and things like that so maybe what they're going to use to um, add to the soil but yeah I'm not sure yet <laughs> okay cool any other questions well we can come back to Lindsay for questions as well um, in our Q&A or also even in our breakout rooms but We'll pass it on to Keith. Thanks so much, Lindsay. You're welcome. I'll share my once more. Um, thank you again, Lindsay. I'll let Kristen um, take it away and introduce, reintroduce Keith. Um, but here we go with a nice quote. Yes, hello for any of us um, that are joining right now. Keith Tires is the winemaker at Kloss and Chase in Prince Edward County. And I'll also um, put his bio in the chat for those of you who didn't hear it the first time. So thanks so much, Keith. And Keith gave us a bit of an overview on some wine and food pairings. And now he can also talk a bit more about um, the Kloss and Chase vineyard. Perfect. So, uh... Following up with, uh, with Lindsay's great presentation, um, wine for me as a winemaker is all about place. Um, wine should define an area from which the grapes are grown and that's two parts. So terroir that we commonly talk about in the grape growing industry to me is about uh, the varietal that's grown in a certain place uh, where it best is allowed to show uh, the summer, the growing season, as well as what the plant, where the plant grows. So what I call the feet of the vine. So the one thing that is constant um, is the soil composition and the soil structure in terms of what it is that, the, the, where the, the grapes grow. Uh, and that's key uh, when you talk about wine all across the world, because generally speaking, wines are grown in two types of soils, either limestone, uh, or volcanic, um, um, and they generally tend to produce what we consider to be some of the finest wines in the world. Limestone um, is almost all of Canada in terms of where grapes are grown. There's obviously sandy loams, uh, soils to the heavy clay loams, um, as well as um, uh, the aspect to the sun uh, and the way things grow in each given area. 
So talking specifically about Prince Edward County now, because that's where I am and that's where I grow grapes and make wine from it. Uh, we are an ancient um, plateau under what would have been Lake Iroquois back in the, before the retreation of the glacier, well, after the retreation of the glacier. But before we were at the very end of the Laurentian um, um, ice sheet. And so Prince Edward County is still rising out of the water as, uh, as it rebounds from the last retreation of the glacier. But what we have, and I was able to go out and get some for you, is we have this incredible gray limestone, uh, very similar to those that if you've ever been through Kingston or through Ottawa, um, it's a calcareous limestone. The difference here is, I don't know if you noticed that, I just broke that rock. And what you end up with is this, this fine shaley limestone, which is the ancient seabed uh, from 100, 400 million years ago. Uh, and what it does is it allows the vines to penetrate down uh, and, um, and, and take up all the micronutrients and the minerals that are in this rock. Uh, and as I was mentioning earlier, I don't know if you can see that little thing there, but that's an old uh, fossilized seashell that came out of the vineyard and we, we get these all the time. And what that means is that we are literally putting our, our vine roots um, in ancient seabed. And therefore, as we talk about food and wine pairings, the affinity with uh, wines that come from Prince Edward County uh, and seafood, uh, more specifically in our whites and in our reds, is, uh, is something that's very prized. So uh, one of the wine critics once said uh, that uh, it's like Chablis found its long lost cousin uh, on the other side of the ocean. Uh, and that happens to be Prince Edward County. So really what you have is you have this limestone rock that's very soft and very porous. It retains moisture um, in the spring when we get our, our melt from winter. Um, and then through that, it will, uh, uh, as the soils dry out, which is very common here in Prince Edward County because uh, we're the second driest county in all of Ontario. Um, we get a, a tremendous amount of drought, and this year was no exception. While those of us to the north uh, and uh, east of us were getting deluged with rain, we were in a, a, a stage one drought up until about <laughs> two weeks ago. And then it started to rain, obviously, because it was harvest, so it always has to rain harvest. Uh, and what you end up with is a, uh, a replenishment of, those, of, of the water to the soil. Um, but as that soil uh, erodes through natural uh, evolution, I guess you'd say, or through the natural going on, on the earth, that water rolls over these rocks, uh, penetrates them, um, breaks the rock down, and all wine is, is groundwater manipulated by sunlight. So what that means is, um, as those micronutrients enter the soil from the rock, the vine takes up the water and the water goes straight to the grape. Uh, and that's what's stored in there. And then when we squish those grapes, that water that came from the root system is what, you, what we ferment and therefore makes the wine. So wine um, should definitely taste like the place that it comes from because what you're drinking is groundwater from that place that's been manipulated by sunlight. And that's the photosynthesizing of the vine. Uh, and that's highly key. Uh, because the vine, the easiest way to think of the vine is the leaves are its engine. And whatever the, however big the engine is, the, the better the ability of the vine to produce carbohydrates and photosynthesize and therefore create flavor compositions that are unique to, to where that vine grows. Um, Prince Edward County is the coldest, coolest uh, wine growing region, both physically and climactically. Um, of anywhere in Canada, um, Niagara being, uh, I think the second hottest or third hottest followed by, uh, North shore Lake Erie, uh, and Pelee Island in particular, or Pelee Island and, um, the Okanagan Valley, which Osoyos is a desert. So it's going to be hot and dry and fairly warm out there. Uh, but what we end up with here in Prince Edward County is that sense of minerality in all our wines. Um, that is unique to us. And then aside from that, uh, for example, here on Claussen Road where we're located, you will have, there's six wineries, all of us making Chardonnay, and you'll have six different Chardonnays because each place is different, each, four, each vineyard is different. Here at Claussen Chase, we have three vineyards on property, uh, two of them growing Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and one growing Chardonnay and Pinot Gris. 
Uh, and the soil composition, although similar in structure, being this calcareous limestone uh, with uh, lots of these alluvial rocks um, um, throughout it, along with uh, some glacial till uh, and clay um, and this mealy, this mealy clay that we get, which is, which is really kind of cool, which allows the vines to penetrate it, um, allow us to do that. And the expression from vineyard to vineyard to vineyard changes. For example, in the, the church side vineyard, which is up on the hill, um, which you saw in the video where they, our church is located, the soils there are quite, they're much deeper uh, and therefore richer clay with that limestone with more rubble dispersed throughout it, but a much more depth to it. And I generally tend to find that the wines that come from, from that side of the road generally tend to have a little more, um, for Chardonnay, more white tree fruit, things like apples and pears, whether it's a golden delicious uh, apple or an Anjou pear, sometimes almost like pear from a can that's syrupy sweet, uh, it has that function to it, but it also has this nice um, minerality in terms of, uh, well, wet rock, uh, and uh, a nice, great acidity to it. Uh, the Pinot uh, generally tends to be more red berry fruit, a little more fruit forward, a um, little more viscous, um, has some earth tone to it, but generally tends to be more on the fruit side, uh, sometimes with some spiciness to it. Uh, in hot years, it's raspberry verging on dark cherry, and in cool years, it's more cranberry, um, what I refer to as the uh, California strawberry in January, which is slightly white, uh, it has a little more acidity to it. Um, and in the South Clo, which is on the south side of the road, literally 100 feet away, um, you have the same soil structure, but less of it. So what you have here is that this calcareous limestone, much closer to the plant or closer to the to ground level with um, some of that rubble, a lot of that rubble, and a very small dusting, for lack of a better word, of soil. Um, so what that means is in the south field, you have a lot of this rock sitting at the top of the soil. And in the summer, uh, more specifically in July and August, especially when it gets hot here and we're in our drought, this rock heats up to the point where uh, on given days when it gets extremely hot, you can't handle it. Uh, it's almost like a hot stone massage therapy. And so what it means is at night when, uh, when the vineyard starts to cool down after the sun sets, um, as the cooled air uh, comes down over the, the, the church side and settles into the valley of the South Clough, all that exposed rock creates its own heat and therefore puts a blanket of hot air up just high enough or just above the fruit zone to allow our fruit in the South Clough to achieve a different level of ripeness, not to the same level of ripeness where it's manipulated by the sunlight like the north side of the road is. This is more manipulated just by general heat. And so what I see here is in, in, my, in my South Clough Chardonnay, for example, see more peach, more nectarine skin uh, as in terms of its fruit composition. And then you also get a beautiful salinity from this rock. Almost like if you were eating a fresh shucked oyster, there's a salty briny nuance that comes from the, the calcium shell. Um, we see that in our, in our Chardonnay. In Pinot, what we generally tend to see, or what I generally tend to see, because it's, it's my opinion, <laughs> um, is I generally tend to see more uh, fruit composition of, of uh, plummy nuance. Uh, along with this green hay um, earth tone to it, almost like a almost like a beetroot. If you've ever boiled beets in water, the 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 water after you're finished has a kind of an earthy, dusty smell to it, but there's a sweetness to it, and that generally tends to be the minerality that comes out of pinot, uh, along with this red fruit and that slight green, for lack of a better word, barnyard nuance. It's not a fault; it's just part of what the soil gives to the wine. Um, and as a winemaker, I try to do the least amount of intervention at the winery. Um, what I try and do is just coax the fruit to display its, itself, its own personality. Um, and I do that through not manipulating it uh, in any way, shape or form uh, up until really to the beginning of primary fermentation, which is the conversion of sugar to alcohol, uh, at which point I will come in after the wine has created some of its own alcohol using its indigenous yeast, I will guide it more to being uh, a finished wine. And the reason being is that um, if you don't do that, more specifically with Pinot, if you don't guide Pinot to where you want it to go, it will become vinegar. Um, Pinot Noir itself, which is, uh, which is one of the grapes that I'm, uh, I'm chasing, um, is, is called the heartbreak grape because it's uh, very difficult to grow. Um, we are a continental climate, so we have uh, warm, 
warm, warm summers uh, and cold winters. Uh, and so what that means is um, here we have to do something quite unique, which is we have to bury the soil around the grapevine to overwinter them, uh, which affects our yield, but also um, affects our soil. So we plant uh, a cover crop between each row um, to increase our organic nutrient. I'm a firm believer in bugs. I'm a firm believer in healthy soils. And I think the easiest way to do that is to let mother nature do what it is that, uh, that needs to occur to give the best result to the wine, uh, to the ground to give the best result to the wine. Um, yeah, so as far as uh, once the grapes come out of the vineyard, we, we hand harvest. Our season starts roughly some years at the end of April, um, but most of the time in the first two weeks of May, we see bud break. And then we're generally harvesting at the end of September, beginning of October. But as uh, weather patterns have changed, um, that varies year to year. And to give a prime example is uh, this year, um, we started picking um, on the 23rd of September um, with sparkling base and then Pinot Gris. And we finished picking uh, on October the 5th. Last year, uh, which was a cool year, if you remember, 2019, um, the, uh, we didn't, we picked sparkling base on September 28th and we finished picking, uh, the last of our grapes, uh, two days ago. So we picked on the 21st and this year we're completely off the vine. And that just all has to do with, with, uh, climactic conditions. Um, so from my standpoint, uh, what I try and do is to do the least amount of intervention to display the best that the, the soil has to offer and the season. So Prince Edward County is our place and the vintage on the bottle will tell you more about the fruit composition in the wine if you can remember that summer. Uh, but wine is a living, breathing organism. Uh, it changes and it develops and it's supposed to. And uh, I always say that the great thing about wine, um, the year on the bottle, uh, when you drink it, will take you back to what you were doing at that time. Um, and it will give you an indication of, or bring, give you an indication of where the wine has gone in the time frame that it's taken. So if you have the ability to age wine, I highly encourage you to do that and to see things develop because there's lots of extra things that come out in wine as it evolves, as it breathes and as it changes um, to take you into the next phase of the wine's life. Uh, and that's the great thing about wine is that it will always continue to evolve and change. Whether it's a commercially made product or whether it's an artisanal made product, it doesn't matter. Wine will evolve in the bottle. And that's the whole point of it. Um, so anyway, if you have questions, please by all means don't hesitate to ask. I'm happy to answer them. And if there's anything else that I can help you with, let me know. Awesome. Thanks so much, Keith. I know you had a question for um, Lindsay that she didn't get a chance to answer as we put you on the spot to talk about your wine. Oh, that's so I don't good. Know if you want to ask that to um, Lindsay? Oh, sure. What is the, what is the question? Oh, that's a good question. So uh, I think my question was, so when you were looking at um, the organic content uh, in the soil in the first, uh, at the first horizon, which are only words for me, right? So yeah. <laughs> um, this is kind of cool because I'm a, I love rock, but I never understood exactly, I shouldn't say that. I'm learning more, which is great uh, from people who are smart <laughs> when it comes to this thing. Uh, but what I'm wondering is, is did you notice a difference in the horizons where the organic content of the soil was higher and how it related to the vigor or the dimension of the plant grown in that soil? Yeah, that's something that we wanted to look at, but that was too much Not for the, okay. yeah, for the time frame. But I think that'd be actually really interesting to look at because I was curious about that too. But yeah, we're, I'm not sure about that. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. It was a really interesting thing. I mean, to talk about Pele Island versus Prince Edward County, just in terms, I mean, we're both, we're a peninsula, <laughs> now an island because there's a canal that runs through us, but um, the, the similarities in terms of our, our evolution as a, a landmass are quite similar. Um, the difference being is that it's further south and way hotter down there than it is up here. And the challenges we face growing on the north side of, of Lake Ontario, as opposed to being out in the middle of, of Lake Erie, 
um, is all is all climate. And right. Prince Edward County has been called the Burgundy of, of Ontario. Uh, and I say, see this rock, see limestone. That's about the only thing that we have in common with Burgundy, uh, other than the fact that we both grow Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, because it's cold here, and it doesn't. Pardon me, it doesn't get that cold in Burgundy um, to do for them to grow grapes in the viticulture that we do here. Just like it doesn't get as cold in North Shore Lake Erie or in in on Pelee Island as it does here. And all those things go into wine, right? Uh, wine is grown in regions in the area in the world where you only get one crop a year it's fine wines i mean they do grow wine in uruguay and in brazil where they get like three crops a year but generally speaking the best wines are, or the most classical wines are grown in places where there's one crop a year where the vines actually get to see dormancy so that's important that we have winter here um, however it really all comes back to geology comes back to the rock, it comes back to the age of the rock, it comes back to where this rock came from uh, and what it provides to the wine. And this rock, although similar in color, um, is completely different than the rock uh, in Niagara. Um, you can't put a shovel in the ground here without hitting rock. Where in Niagara, and this is personal experience, digging post holes at the end of a row in Prince Edward County, um, you're cursing because every time you put the shovel in the ground, you hear the ting of hitting a rock. Yes. Uh, digging a post hole in the dolomite, uh, with the dolomite limestone and the sandy loam tills, uh, glacial tills of Niagara, you can put a shovel fairly far down and not hit a rock. And when you do find a rock, it's usually the size of a, of a, a small football, as opposed to all these little little rocks that you see, you see me throwing up inside of the, uh, the, uh, the screen. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting, and, and I think we as Canadians, I'm going to get on a little soapbox here, um, should drink more Canadian wine. Uh, and uh, for our international friends, because I understand we have people from other parts of the world on the call, um, Canada's poised as a cool climate wine region. Uh, for the last five to ten years, we've been drinking wines that are higher in alcohol, bigger in weight, uh, a little more sugar, a little more glycerol. Uh, and what we're now seeing is people want wines that are lower in alcohol, have more acidity, and have a more definitive um, story to tell about the place from which they grow. And I think that that's an interesting switch that's occurring in the, overall in wine drinking. So anyway, there we go. Thanks. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Anything I can answer? You can add um, your Thanks, question guys. in the chat, or you can um, unmute yourself and ask a question if you'd like to um, ask Lindsay or Keith while we have some experts here with us who <laughs> know a lot about uh, wine. We're zone uh, three, so we're cold. We roughly have um, about 120 to 130 frost-free days. That is, <laughs> year, that changes year to year. Um, so we we are prone to late spring frosts here. So it's not uncommon for us to see a frost uh, at the beginning to middle of May. Uh, and in 2015, we had one on May 2-4 weekend, which was devastating. So it's, it's, it poses a challenge here. Um, I think we have, we have 1,250 degree days worth of, of grape growing here, where North Shore Lake Erie is upwards of like 1,500, uh, and Niagara Peninsula is, is roughly around the same. I think they're 14 something. So all those things um, makes, it an issue, makes it challenging. So I missed that one instead of climate and soils. I'll look it up here. Uh, actually, fair enough. It's funny that you say that. Um, so the Finger Lakes are directly straight across the lake from us. So if I turn my chair around and if I could walk in a straight line that way, I would walk into Rochester uh, and then further south into, uh, into the Finger Lakes. 
So we do have that. The difference here is, is that we're on the north side of Lake Ontario. Um, and I never talked about the lake as a moderating influence, but it is Lake Ontario that allows us to grow grapes here in Prince Edward County um, because um, it's a big, deep body of water. Um, it's the third deepest Great Lake um, with uh, Lake Superior being obviously the, the deepest and points in uh, Michigan. Um, however, here, the deepest part of Lake Ontario is directly off the south shore of Prince Edward County. So even when the lake has become 95% frozen, like it did a couple of years ago in, in that polar vortex, um, that portion of Lake Ontario does not freeze. So what happens is we have, um, we have all the water coming out of the Great Lakes, flooding through the Niagara River into Lake Ontario, being allowed to run free uh, all the way up to Colbert pretty much, uh, when the peninsula starts to jut itself out at, at Brighton and it pushes all that water that was going um, through the St. Lawrence around Prince Edward County. So you get this interesting vortex of water and therefore um, a little moderating influence from, from that deep water that allows us to maintain um, the ability to grow grapes in, in a given year. The other influence here is we have, uh, we have uh, a smaller bay called the Bay of Quinney to the north of us, which is quite shallow um, compared to Lake Ontario. So Lake Ontario on the, you know, the south side of us, right off kind of right across from Rochester is 283 fathoms deep, which is like 300 feet, uh, where Bay of Quinney on average is roughly between 20 to 30 feet deep. So it's a very narrow, um, a moderate body of water uh, that can heat up quite quickly. And with our predominance of weather patterns coming from um, Western Ontario, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, are coming from the westerlies, um, that body of water being shallow and creating that much warmth when it gets heated up will actually push weather patterns north of us. Um, and, and then the county, as it heats up, because it is elevated above uh, uh, above the lake uh, and it has exposure to the sunlight as these dark heavy clay loam soils and the rock that's here warm up as well everything else goes so I saw one question there cover crop so we use um, I'll talk about that um, and then I'll talk about the shell. <laughs> wow these are good ones um, cover crop we use an organic matter builder um, it has six different plants in it uh, it has um, winter wheat, or sorry, rye grass, uh, or winter rye. It has um, fiscue, it has red clover, daikon radish, oats, and barley. And the reason being is that all those things in combination allow for natural, um, um, natural binding of nitrogen into the soil, but it also encourages bugs. Uh, because it allows for the, the soils to be uh, aerated and have lots of oxygen. And so what we see is we're starting to see more worms and bugs in our soil, which is only a good thing as far as I'm concerned. And um, the great thing about the clay loam soils that we're on is because we are so dry for a lot of the year, when we get the rains that Ontario has been getting for the last three days, if you dry farm and you till a lot, uh, you end up with hard pan. Um, so what happens is if you're, if you're cultivating uh, and opening up the soil for oxygen and it rains, all that moisture goes in, creates a layer of, of hard clay, and you start to get um, dead zones within your soil. So by keeping the cover crop in until this time of the year before we have to bury our vines, um, we're keeping our soil loose. We're also giving a place for that water to go. So any extra water uh, that the cover crop doesn't take up seeps into the soil. And then what we'll do is we'll start to break up that cover crop uh, and put those organic nutrients back in the soil and allow them to replenish the soil naturally uh, as opposed to constantly using um, um, fertilizers to, to spread on the, on the ground. Um, climate change. Well, you can, you can talk to any grape grower just like you can talk to any farmer. Um, everything is a variable. Uh, now, we don't have any type of 
normality when it comes to our weather systems. So we had a uh, unusually warm and mild winter here with not a lot of snow cover. Um, in February, the there's a lot of things you take as a, as a winemaker and, and somebody who's been here for a while. I, I mean, I've been doing this for, I've been in the area for 17 years making wine for the last five. But what we see here is we see a lot of um, other things that give us good indications. So we're, we make a, we produce a, a fair amount of maple syrup uh, and maple syrup, they were pulling off in February, beginning of March this year, which means everything got warm fast. Uh, and then we ended up with a weather anomaly in May where we saw minus four and five for three days in a row. Um, and then literally a week later, we had plus 20 and, and the vines just started right up. Um, so we're seeing less precipitation on average in the spring, uh, although that's not always true. But in the last, since 2015, we've had three droughts. Nothing as severe as 2016, which was, I guess, actually here, I'll just lay it out for you. So since 2015, um, we had minus five on May 24th in 2015. 2016 was the driest year in 60 years. 2017 was the wettest spring uh, in 70 years. Um, 2018 was the most humid September and wettest September we've had in 10 years. Uh, 2019 was the coolest and dampest spring um, that I've seen since 09. And then 2020, um, we were, we were dry for most of the winter, not a lot of snow, snow cover. Uh, we had a fairly um, uneventful spring in terms of rain. Uh, and then we got dry and hot after we were cold there for a bit. And we were in a drought all the way up until probably a week and a half ago. Um, we haven't seen a significant amount of rain. Uh, there's not a lot of groundwater. So is it impacting? Absolutely. Uh, it's reduced yields. Uh, our yields, although we had lots of grapes on the vine this year, our physical weight was down because we had dehydration, which is good because then we have wines that are super ultra concentrated. So you make less wine, but you make better wine uh, with a lot more flavor composition, a lot more color, a lot of more depth and richness, and hopefully a lot, uh, all those things go into allowing a wine to age further down the road. Um, and I think that is predominantly what's happening. The other thing is because of droughts and stuff like that, we're still retaining that natural acidity. Um, so we're making bigger, bolder wines, um, not necessarily higher in alcohol, although this year it looks like it'll probably be higher in alcohol naturally. Uh, it will just uh, end up being where we're going. So climate change is here and it is affecting us. What do you think the biggest challenge in the winemaking process is? Uh, the winemaking process, the biggest challenge is knowing when to pick. Uh, when to take the vine, take the grapes off the vine is probably the, the, the thing that I challenge myself to every year because it's a fine line. Because as grapes get ripe, um, what happens is the skins get thinner and the thinner the skins get, the more susceptible they are to disease, uh, whether it's through fungal pressure uh, or just heat because you can have ripe grapes uh, and then get tons of heat in September and the skins will just fall apart. Um, so they all become part and parcel in what it is that you want to do. And when you start picking today, uh, the vine doesn't say, oh, you started picking that block today, so we'll just stop growing. The vine continues to photosynthesize, produce carbohydrates, increase sugar contribution. And as it's increasing sugar, it's decreasing acidity. So it becomes a, a challenge as to when you pick, because ultimately when you get to the end of the pick, for example, in Pinot Noir, where you start and what you finish with are two different things. Um, they're all Pinot Noir, but the numbers and everything like that have, have, have changed a bit. And therefore the composition of the wine and how the wine comes out tasting will be different. And, and, and that's just with any crop. It, I always try and relate stuff back to food because of coming out of the hospitality business. Uh, it, and the easiest thing to say is, is just think of tomatoes. Um, if you grow a tomato in your backyard, and you go out and you look at it on the Monday and it's like pink and you think, wow, you know, they're calling for three days of nice, nice weather. Uh, I'm going to eat you on Thursday night. Um, and you walk out Thursday and then you realize you got to take one of your kids to hockey or baseball or wherever you got to go 
So all of a sudden you're out running around, you forget about that tomato when you come back Saturday and it's mush. Uh, the same thing happens to grapes. Um, so thinking about when you want to do it uh, and getting it going are two different things because you, you have to start at some point and sometimes you start when you don't want to knowing that when you're finished, you're where you need to be because when you hand harvest, it takes time to pick everything with two hands and lots of people. Uh, what controls the alcohol content and why? Um, sugar. Sugar's predominantly the, the, the major contrib contributing factor to that. Uh, and that can come in two ways. Uh, obviously the first choice is natural sugar, um, just because it's part of the grape and therefore when you ferment it out, your alcohol should naturally be bounced off by your, by your acid and the weight of the wine. And those things uh, are ultimately what I'm looking for as a winemaker is I want balance. I want wine that has lots of fruit contribution, that has earth con earthy contributions, that has barrel contribution, that has acidity, that has uh, this around viscous mouth, but it still has a cleansing effect. It's not super flowing, or the alcohol isn't too high and out of balance with the acid and the weight and all those other things. Um, so you can make alcohol, right? Like anybody can make alcohol. You, you need sugar uh, and you need yeast. Um, and so what happens is it, you can make more alcohol if you have grapes. Um, but if you have unripe grapes or grapes that don't have any phys physiological contribution to them, then all you're doing is making alcohol. And then you have wines that are out of balance. So what that means is you have wines that, that where the alcohol has a lot of heat. And if you think of like drinking a spirit straight that has that heat and that, that warmth in your, in your, in the middle of your mouth, um, you want the other things around it to help provide structure to carry that alcohol. Um, and otherwise you just have a burn and then you have, you have a flabby wine and the reverse happens if you don't have enough alcohol and you have too much acidity, then you have a wine that's, you know, can clean, can clean grease off, off of metal because it's so acidic. Which really best to showcase the minerality of the rock you broke earlier, probably Chardonnay. Um, and you see that in the, in the loyalist, which comes from a very rocky vineyard. It's, it's not our own vineyard. It's a vineyard that's closer to the lake shore. Um, in, in a slightly sandier loam soil. Um, but you see that minerality there because it's unadulterated by the, uh, uh, by any type of, of, uh, of anything else. Now, the other cool thing is, is, is it changes from varietal to varietal, right? So we talked about that minerality, that sense of wet stone or, um, um, some people call it wet pavement or wet stainless steel, um, all those things, or for me, it's oyster shell, which is also some salinity. Those things generally tend to show themselves in white. Uh, in Pinot, um, it generally tends to be more earth tones, whether it's mushroom or like cedar or forest floor. And when I describe things like that, um, if you've ever walked in the fall this time of the year, uh, especially now that it's wet and stuff is underneath the canopy, and you're walking through like a, a conservation area or through backwoods, and you're kicking up those leaves and all the things underneath it, that are the decomposing uh, organic matter, um, they have a certain smell to them. Uh, and I find that sometimes in given years, uh, our wines have that type of earth tone to them. Um, so in Pinot, it's more earth tones. Uh, and in Chardonnay, it's more that, that, that salinity, whetstone minerality to it. Good enough. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Keith and Lindsay, um, for your presentations. I definitely learned a lot. I think I definitely need to take a trip to the county in Pele Island, and I really want to get out and <laughs> do some experimentation with cooking and, and, and wines. Um, we have one uh, part left to the trip. We hope you can stick around for that. Uh, we are going to do breakout rooms um, on Zoom, so break you into um, smaller groups. Um, give everybody a chance to maybe introduce themselves, talk to people um, in the group. And if Lindsay and Keith can stick around, you can ask some questions um, to them as well. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now for anyone who wasn't able to attend the session.